Hello, brothers and sisters. It is a great day to study the Word of God. I invite you all to join me in exploring through the Bible. God does not abandon His people. He stays true to His Word. Though He condemns those who don't turn to Him for salvation, He still gives us all the chance to repent and reconcile with Him. His grace is given to both the Jews and the Gentiles, despite one's weakness in the flesh. God knows that you and I cannot adhere to the law because of the sinful nature we are born with and shows us His mercy. He alone can save us and He does it out of free will. But before we go any further into our study, let us have a quick recap of what we learned in our previous discussion. First, we learned that God had shown mercy to the Gentiles as well. They once were separated from God, but because of His grace, they too entered into salvation and now are called children of the living God. Here, we also learned that God did not choose us because we were worthy of His saving grace, but it was the will of God. He wanted to save us and so He rescued us by reaching down to us and pulled us out of the darkness. Secondly, we realize that only a remnant from among the Jews and the Gentiles will be saved in the end. Though God won't stop looking out for the lost sheep, His decision is final. Some will be condemned while a few others will win the crown of eternal life with God. Only those that come to God will be saved, for the righteousness produced by man cannot save him from damnation. Thirdly, we learned that the Israelites are responsible for their downfall because they failed to recognize their time of visitation. God had warned them a million times, but they did not recognize the consequences of their actions. They failed to recognize the risen Christ and because of which God rejected them. They were like the seeds that fell on the thorns. For a brief moment, they heard God's message but the thorns towered over them, choking them with the anxieties and pleasures of this world. They had the only God-given religion, but they failed to realize that it doesn't generate righteousness. Yet, the Jews still have a chance to be saved like the Gentiles. Though they failed repeatedly, they are still God's firstborn, and He will save them if they believe and acknowledge the gospel as the truth. And finally, we discuss the present condition of the church and religion. We realize that the church and religion are in no better shape to strengthen us with the knowledge of God. Though they may provide us with the law that directs us to Christ, we learned that such institutions do not provide us with the righteousness of God, except for God Himself. Christ is the only way to make us right with God. So let us follow Him and He will lead us straight into eternal life with God. In the meantime, how much do we know of the present condition of the Israelites? And do we know how God saved the remnants from the Israelites and the Gentiles? Let's find out as we continue our discussions with Paul. Welcome, dear friends, to another study of Romans with Through the Bible. Today, let's continue to listen to Paul as he speaks to us about God's salvation for the Jew and the Gentile. So let's begin. The Present Standing of Israel Romans 10, 5 For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Granted that you could attain a righteousness in the law, it would be your own righteousness, not God's righteousness. It could never measure up to his. Romans 10.6 But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. He talks about ascending up to heaven to bring it down, or going down to hell and bringing it up. My friend, the righteousness that Paul is talking about, he quotes from Deuteronomy 30.11-14, which shows us clearly, that it is available. Romans 10.7 Or, who shall descend into the deep? 
that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. You don't have to make a trip anywhere to get it. Romans 10:8 But what saith The word is nigh thee even thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which we preach it is available right where you are sitting a great many folk think that they have to go to an altar in some sort of meeting to be saved but salvation is available to you right where you are now romans 10:9 to 10 that if thou shall confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation there are many folk who maintain that a believer has to make a public confession of faith that is not what paul is saying here it does not mean to go forward in a public meeting In many churches you come across people who come forward to the altar but they were not all saved Paul is not saying that you have to make a public confession Paul is saying that man needs to bring into agreement his confession and his life the mouth and the heart should be in harmony saying the same thing it is with the heart that you believe your heart means your total personality your entire being You see there are some folk who say something with their mouths they give lip service to God but their hearts are far from him when you make a public confession you be dead sure that your heart is right along with you that you are not just saying the words that mean nothing to you personally if there is confession without faith it is due either to self deception or to hypocrisy if there is faith without confession it may be covered as it seems to me that paul is saying here that james is accurate faith without works is dead james 2:20 if you are going to work your mouth be sure you have faith in your heart my friend believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead means that the resurrection of christ is the heart of the gospel as paul said earlier he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification romans 4:25 Romans 10:11 For the scripture saith whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed Paul is quoting from Isaiah 28:16 Therefore thus saith the Lord God behold I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make haste The difference in our translation is not due to Paul's changing the quotation rather the word for confound and make haste is the same it means to flee because of fear paul is quoting isaiah to enforce his previous statement that the by faith righteousness is taught in other passages of the old testament this passage also shows the universal character of salvation in the word whosoever romans 10:12 for there is no difference between the jew and the greek for the same lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him there is no distinction between the jew and the greek or gentile all have sinned and come short of the glory of god all if they are to be saved must come the same way to christ the lord jesus said no man cometh unto the father but by me that is john 14:6 you can't come to him by the old testament ritual or by the mosaic law salvation is offered to all people on the same basis of mercy by faith hear and believe the gospel present salvation for both jew and gentile romans 10:13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved this is a remarkable statement which paul draws from the old testament see joel 2:32 to enforce his argument that salvation is by faith this makes it very clear that both jew and gentile are to call on the lord to call upon the name of the lord means to believe in the lord jesus christ romans 10:14 to 15 how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written 
How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It is necessary to understand Paul's position in order to appreciate these verses. The Jews, his own people, hated the Apostle Paul even though they applauded Saul, the Pharisee. He is showing the logic of his position. They rejected his claim or the right of any of his apostles to proclaim a gospel that omitted the Mosaic system which had degenerated into Phariseeism. Paul shows that there must be messengers of the gospel who have credentials from God. Paul, you recall, began this epistle with the claim that he was a called apostle of Jesus Christ. See Romans 1.1. There follows a logical sequence. Preachers must be sent in order for people to hear that they might believe, for they would not know how to call upon God. Paul pinpoints all on believing. This, therefore, necessitated his ministry. Paul clinches this bit of logic with a quotation from Isaiah 52.7 which says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. This quotation precedes the marvellous 53rd chapter of Isaiah, which is a prophecy of Christ's death and resurrection. He opened it with the prophet's query, Who hath believed our report? Isaiah 53, 1 The law of Moses surely was not glad tidings of good things, but it was a ministration of death. We are told here that the feet of those who bear glad tidings are beautiful. Johann Peter Lang had an appropriate word on this. In their running and hastening, in their scaling, obstructing mountains, they are the symbols of the earnestly desired winged movement and appearance of the gospel itself. It is wonderful to get out the word of God. It is wonderful to have feet that the Lord calls beautiful. Romans 10.16 but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? While many people are amazed by the great number of folk who come up to them and tell them that they have received Christ because of their ministry, when you look at the total picture, it's a very small minority who have believed the report. Not very many. Romans 10.17 So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, this is so important. Faith does not come by preaching philosophy or psychology or some political nostrum. It comes by preaching the word of God. Until you hear the word of God, you cannot be saved. Romans 10.18 and 19 But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, Did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy 32.21 Today God is calling out a people from among Gentiles. Paul will develop this thought in the next chapter. Romans 10.20 but Esaias is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Paul quotes from Isaiah 65, one, I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. Even Isaiah predicted Gentile salvation. The Gentiles in darkness were finding Christ. What excuse could Israel, who had the Old Testament scriptures offer? They are entirely without excuse. Romans 10.21 But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Have you ever stopped to think how tiresome it is to hold your hands out for a long period of time? Try it sometime and see how long you can do it. It is one of the most tiring things in the world. When Moses held up his hands in prayer to God for Israel's victory in battle, Aaron and Hur had to prop up his hands because he got so tired holding them up. 
See Exodus 17, 19-12. But God says, I have been holding out my hands to a disobedient people. See Isaiah 65, 2. No one knows how gracious God has been to the nation of Israel. Stephen's final word to this nation is revealing. He is stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, and in years ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which shewed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Acts 7 51 to 53. This is not confined to Israel. It could be said today that God is holding out his hands to a gainsaying world. I marvel at the patience of God. I do not mean to be irreverent, but if I were running the show on this little earth down here, I would make a lot of changes. I would move it like a bulldozer. But God is just holding out his hands to our gainsaying world. Chapter 11 We will see that God has a future purpose with Israel. In chapter 9, we saw God's past dealings with Israel. In chapter 10, we saw God's present dealings with Israel. A remnant of Israel is finding salvation. Perhaps you are saying, well, it must be a very small remnant. It is larger than you might think it is. It is estimated that there are about 15 million Jews throughout the world. And the percentage of those who are believers is probably much higher than that of the Gentile world with its 4 billion people. We have seen that the nation rejected Christ and the by-faith righteousness of God in Christ, which was offered to them. And now God has rejected them temporarily as a nation. Two questions naturally arise. Has God permanently rejected them as a nation? In other words, does the nation of Israel have a future? Secondly, are all the promises of the Old Testament nullified by the rejection of Israel? Remember that God had promised primacy to Israel in the Old Testament. He had said they would be the head, not the tail of the nations. See Deuteronomy 28.13 My friend, all the promises of the Old Testament will have a literal fulfillment. Paul will make that clear. Remnant of Israel finding salvation. Romans 11.1 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. What people is Paul talking about? Israel. In case the Emilianists might miss this, Paul is very specific. Paul himself is present proof. He is a true Israelite of genuine stock. He is descending from Abraham. He is from one of the twelve tribes of Israel, Benjamin one of the two tribes that never seceded from the nation. He was 100% Israelite. God forbid is more accurately, let it not be. It is a strong negative. Even the form of a question demands a negative answer. God has not cast away Israel as a nation. Romans 11, 2-3 God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What he not, what the scripture saith of Elias, now he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Paul uses old Elijah as an illustration, and he makes a good one. Elijah stood for God, and he stood alone. How I admire that man standing alone for God against 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah goes to the Lord to complain. He says, Lord, I am all alone. I am the only one left. God says, wait a minute. You think you're alone? You're not alone. Romans 11.4 But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Elijah was not totally unaware that God had been working in the hearts of 7,000 men. If there were 7,000 men who had not bowed the knee to Baal, then it follows that there were about twice as many women who did not bow the knee either. If you go by percentages, 
For the northern kingdom, this was a sizable remnant in the day of Ahab and Jezebel. Romans 11.5 Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. God always had a remnant in Israel. That remnant today is composed of those Jews who have come to Christ. This is the reason Paul will say later that all Israel is not Israel. Romans 11.6 And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. In other words, grace and works represent two mutually exclusive systems. They are diametrically opposed to each other. The remnant at this time is composed of those who are not saved by works or by merit. They are saved by the grace of God. The Future Purpose of God From the day Paul wrote down to the present concerns those who will accept Christ. What about those who do not accept Christ? Well, the remainder of Israel is hardened. Let's close here, dear friends, with the thought that we or the Jew or anyone cannot be saved on merit or works, but only by the grace of God. And that grace is sufficient to you and me, no matter what has transpired in our life. God bless you as you grow closer to your Savior. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed today's study of Through the Bible. I hope you are thrilled to know that you need not go anywhere to be saved. You can be saved right now. And you don't need to go to a church to make a public declaration of your faith. Right this moment, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, who died for your sins and resurrected to give you the gift of eternal life, you are saved. God never asks you to acknowledge your faith in public. He wants you to tell Him personally and believe with all your whole heart in the good news that sets you free from death. Salvation is offered to all people on the basis of mercy, which means that there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, for God saves all who call upon Him and believe in His Son, Jesus. We believe because we have heard the Word of God, but not many are as fortunate as us. Many are still living in total ignorance of the gospel, but they can only be brought to the light when we take the word of God to them so that they can hear and believe. As we come to a close, remember, you and I aren't the only ones fighting the good fight. There are many of us around the world persevering in our walk of faith. Though we all lead different lives, we are one in the body of Christ. We face the same trials and tribulations that the world hurls at us for not submitting to its will. We are all persecuted for being children of God. And yet, we are the sons who have attained salvation by faith. God has not closed the doors of salvation. He is still waiting for more candidates to enter His kingdom. So let us deliver the word of God to a darkened world so that they can hear the good news and be saved. In the meantime, what happens to those who do not accept Christ as their Savior? And why can't they acknowledge the truth? To find out, stay tuned to the next episode of Through the Bible. God bless you.